Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, We'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, In addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. I've been keeping Jesus at a distance, so afraid to let him get too close to the two lives I've been living as if he couldn't see them both, close enough to feel the warmth of the fire far enough away for me to hide. But I'm tired of walking the wire between the darkness and the light. No more Jesus at a distance. No more pushing you away. I don't want to settle for the back road of some Sunday morning faith. So I'm holding nothing back now because there's nothing you don't see. No more Jesus at a distance can change every part of me. I was offered resurrection, but I settled for the grave. I had the chance to walk on water, but I chose to play it safe. I've been hiding from the healer. I thought my wounds were out of reach, but at the end of all my running, you're still running after me. So no more Jesus at a distance, no more pushing you away. I don't want to settle for the back road of some Sunday morning faith. So I'm holding nothing back now because there's nothing you don't see. No more Jesus at a distance can change every part of me. All my dreams and all my treasures, when I can barely hold it together, when I can't control where tomorrow's going, when the ghosts of my yesterday come a-calling, who I am when there's no one else around, when the sun comes up till the sun goes down, so no more Jesus at a distance, no more pushing you away. I don't want to settle for the back road of some Sunday morning faith. So I'm holding nothing back now because there's nothing you don't see. No more Jesus at a distance. Please change every part of me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time here this morning. God, we love you. We declare our love to you. But we'll acknowledge that there's a battle going on in our heart, in our mind, We know there's an external battle going on for our focus, for our allegiance, for our worship. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray you do a work here today in this place and online where everyone is listening live or listening after the fact, God. Holy Spirit, do your work. We don't want to love you at a distance, Jesus. We don't want to run from you. We don't want to be walking that line of darkness And like God, we want to give all of ourselves to you, Lord, we pray. God, as we lift up your word, we believe that it's fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it's written without error, and we hold it as the authority in our life. Holy Spirit, would you have your way in our hearts now? In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. That little poem that I wrote, that I wrote, that I read, was written by Casting Crowns. I didn't write it, sorry. That was me plagiarizing there for a moment. It's funny, I was out doing some work around the house and I'd already been planning on the message. It was Friday and that song came on and I had to come down the ladder I was on and go into the shed to make sure I emailed, I text that song to myself because I thought, wow, how appropriate are those lyrics to what we're talking about in the book of James? How often is it that we say we really want to draw close to God, but then we really struggle to do so? We're going to get right to being honest here in the morning, this morning, right off the bat. How many of you in the room feel like you really want to be close to God, but boy, it's really hard sometimes. You feel like you're torn in two different directions. We'll raise our hand for the rest of you in the room here today. (laughs) So when we think, though, about being rooted in Christ, when we think about having that closeness in Christ Jesus, we need to know this, is that being humble is the fruit of being rooted 
in Christ Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about today. That's where we're at in James chapter 4. We need to be rooted in our, our, to be rooted in Christ. We need to walk in humility. I do believe, though, that we actually more often than not walk in false humility. We live under a false definition of what humility looks like to the point where as soon as we think we're being humble or say that we're humble, we've now become prideful. And so we're going to talk through a lot of that here today. But what our hope is, what our hope is, is that we leave both challenged and encouraged that growing closer to God and growing further away from the world is actually easier than we often make it. Does that sound like a good promise here today in the message? All right, well, we're going to cover it in kind of four ways today. It's four Ps because we're pastors and that's how we do things. But we're going to take a look at the promise. We're going to look at the process. We're going to take a look at the problem. And then we're going to end with talking about our posture and what that needs to look like as we follow Jesus fully and wholly here today. So would you stand with me this morning? We're in the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. We're going to read it together. For those of you that are just jumping into the series now, we've been in it for a few weeks. You can find all that content on YouTube, Facebook, online. Just put in Christ Community Church East Taunton. You'll find it on any of those, any of those platforms. Uh, this was written to multiple churches scattered uh, after Christ ascended to heaven, churches scattered all throughout the area, and it's a letter to believers. And so some of the language sounds like, oh, they got to be talking to unbelievers because believers would never do that. Yeah. And so it's written to believers. So as you hear this today, I want you to hear it for yourself because it's who it's written to. Let's read together. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. This is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I'd like to read verse 7 and 8 together. Uh, in unison, one more time, if we could go back there, Joe, I'd appreciate it. Verse 7 and 8. Let's read that out loud together. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Amen. Keep going. Yeah, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Amen. I always miss that last part. God, may you add a blessing to the reading of your word. May it pierce our hearts today in a way that might hurt a little, uh, but that's followed through with some real spiritual healing and that we would know you more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And so we're going to look at this passage kind of backwards today. We're going to preach it from 10 going back to the beginning today because we want to start you off with what the promise is. The promise is this in verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. That sounds pretty good. Anybody with me here today? Isn't that like sound like good news? Like, hey, that sounds simple. I would like to be definitely lifted up by the Lord. Does that not sound like a good thing? But it starts with humbling ourselves. But the promise is if we humble ourselves, God will lift us up. When we think about that lifting up, though, we need to know what that means. What that means is, is that he takes us from the gloom that he found us in, and he brings us to the glory that he is in. He wants us to live in his glory and in his presence and be filled with his blessing and his provision and abundance and all the things that come along with being with him fully 
and holy. And, and as, that, as that passage even said, that the lyrics to that song from Casting Crown said, you know, we, we get fearful or, or we think his healing doesn't, doesn't actually come into our life, that, that, that our, our wounds are too hard to do that, or we, we want to we, we believe that he can have us walk on water, so to speak, but then we, we don't believe that maybe that's for us. But this passage is saying, if you humble yourselves before the Lord, if you make your life about him and others, the first and second greatest commandment, he is going to lift you up to his place of glory, to live an abundant life that we've never even imagined. And not just in eternity, but here on this side of eternity. Does that sound like good news? If it sounds like good news, say good news. news. It's good news. And so here's the process. He talks with us about this process. It's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Of course, you think you, I gave my little tell earlier. I don't remember the last half of verse 8. I cut it there. But he says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. That sounds pretty simple, right? That whole part of it, like, Submit yourselves then to God. That word submit is hard. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. And then resist the devil. Most of us in the room, when we hear resist the devil, we think like Satan, actual capital D devil, like a a person who's coming for us. And because we don't visually see a devil or Satan, or we think, oh, I have nothing to do with anything satanic or any of those kind of things. Like, I'm running far from the devil. We also picture the devil being real gnarly and ugly looking with horns and a nasty snoot and a big pitchfork or however you picture him. And we think, I don't want any part of that. But when you look further into what this passage has to say, the word devil, it's a little d. It means di- it's, the word is diablos, and it's actually exactly that as the little character would tell you it's a little devil it's actually the little devil that's inside of us it's our own sin nature it can also mean the devil himself if you go back to chapter one it talks about how we're actually drawn away by our own sinful desires and then the enemy comes and brings death with that and so there's two things at play here so we think about resisting the devil We have to first think about the devil that lives inside of us. I'm not going to have you raise hands, but there is a little devil living inside of us. We're trying to make him smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Amen, somebody? We're trying to make him smaller and smaller and smaller, but at the same time, he comes. He comes back, doesn't he? The process, though, of doing away with the little devil, whether it's a she-devil or a he-devil, depending on what gender you are here in the room... Is really simple. It says to resist him, but it's often hard, isn't it? Doesn't it seem hard? I don't know about you, but I feel like when those devil, the little devil comes calling, sometimes it's just like a switch that comes on and you're like a hungry dog on a meat wagon. There ain't nothing talking you out of what's about to happen. <laughs> you guys with me here today? Hope you're with me online. But God wants more for us. He wants more for our life. And so he talks about this process of submitting ourselves then to the Lord, resisting the devil. And the the, the word here is is that he'll flee from us. He'll flee from us. How powerful is that? When I read this, I think about all the times in Scripture where Jesus himself in the flesh is walking the earth. Of course, the Holy Spirit is the one that's present on earth now out of the trinity, out of the three. But as he was walking on the earth, when he would cast out demons, they would flee from him. I mean, they would would flee from him. One of the parables is that they went into a bunch of pigs and the pigs went and drowned each other, right? And then the townsmen came out and like wanted to kill him because he killed their their pigs. I didn't realize Jewish people ate pigs, but either way, that's a thing for a different day. Maybe they were Samaritans. But either way, I think about that flee like, We need the enemy, we need our sin to flee from us, and we also need to flee from our sin. But the question is, is what do we flee to? This says we flee to God. And so we've summed it up easily here, and we have to run, we have to to resist, we we have to run, resist, and repeat. Okay, can you guys say that with me? Run, resist, and repeat. Now, this might seem kind of like a simple little thing, and oh, I don't know if this is really going to work, but if we grab a hold of what the meaning is in this passage, 
we sum it up. Wherever we go, we can think about the fact that I need to run. So where do we run to according to this passage? Anybody? God. You can put in the comments online if you're there. We run to God, and who do we resist? The devil. Which devil? Maybe all of the devils, right? The devil, us as the devil, all sin. We're resisting that. And then what do we do? We repeat it, right? Over and over and over again. All right, this is what we're going to do. Here's a half the room. We're going to do right here, we're going to do run. Up here, we're going to do resist in the balcony. Balcony, what's your word? And over here, it's going to be what? Repeat. It works the other way too, doesn't it? <laughs> we make this walk, this journey of sanctification. If you're new to church words, sanctification means that God is transforming us into his image. We think, though, it's going to go like that. And it does sometimes. Sometimes the sin just falls right off and we never look back. But a lot of times it's a journey of us slowly progressing towards this glory of eternity that's coming our way, but we make it way more complicated than we need to make it. Anybody with me here today? Gosh, do we make it complicated. And so we're going to unpack why we make it so complicated. And so the next part is the problem. The problem is this. All of us are adulterous people. Now, Maybe you think, oh, well, I've, you know, I've never committed adultery. I'm married. None of that's ever happened. Some in the room, we have committed actual adultery. But the truth is, is that humankind, in all 66 books of Scripture, front to back, guess what God defines us as, his creation? Adulterous people. The whole book is about our unfaithfulness and his faithfulness. If you want me to sum up the story of the Bible... From chapter 3 of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation is our unfaithfulness in relation to his faithfulness. Amen? Amen. You still need to read the book, though. Okay? You can't use the spark notes, as Conrad said last week, and I reminded him that if he wants to go way back, they were cliff notes, just saying. A little rack of them at Walmart, you go in and get them. But either way, we've got to ask ourselves this question, am I actually resisting the devil of whatever sort we're talking about fully and wholly, or am I allowing him to live in my life? Am I cheating on God with someone or something else? So who are you cheating on God with? Maybe you're like no one or nothing. Let me help you along a little bit. Because I'd argue if you're breathing air... At some level, there's a little battle going on. Now, I would, I would also agree that as we grow older and more mature in the Lord, we may never be sinless, but we should sin less. Hopefully you saw what I did there. But the truth is, is we all have a wayward heart before the Lord. If it happened to everybody in the Bible, it's true that it would happen to us, but who are you cheating on God with? You see here, it says in verse 4 through 6, it says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity towards God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's really hard language. Let me remind you, this was written, written to born-again followers of Jesus. That's me. That's most of us in the room. And so it's a hard word. Because we can't hold on to the things of the world and the sins of our flesh and the sins of the past and hold on to God at the same time. And so what are you cheating on or who are you cheating on God with? Maybe it's an actual person and some things need to be done in your life or you need to come to repentance and you need to have some hard conversations and hopefully that, that relationship can be restored. We're here to help you as pastors. We've got counselors to help and elders and we're here for that if it's really in that place but we can cheat on God with anything. Someone say anything. anything. This is the hard part of the message we're getting into here, guys. It'll get better, but we have to take an assessment of where are we in our hearts? What is the problem? What's the thing between me and God? Look, it could be your career. Maybe you've been praying for this career your whole life and you finally have it, but it's been so overwhelming. You've just gone all in on this career and now it's pulled you all away from God. And now 
everything you do, every time you're on your phone, every place you are, you can't even take a mental day off, even if you have a physical day off, because life is just all about your career or your business or maybe your bank account. You're just kind of stacking it up. Or maybe it's the opposite and you're just dreaming of the career and dreaming of actually having a balance in your bank account. But either way, it's the same scenario. You've made something else your God and not God. Sometimes it's our actual, it's our kids. We're trying to live vicariously through our children or we've held our children in such cherished spot that whatever they do, we just think is the most absolute wonderful thing in the world and they can do no wrong or we're trying to prop them up or we're going into all kinds of crazy debt or we're going into relational emotional debt because we've put every ounce of energy we have into our children and we've actually been worshiping them instead of worshiping God. Does that sound like the world we live in here today? I'm not telling you not to love your kids or raise them up in the right way, but they're not going to save you. They can't give you the abundant life that God wants you to have, and you can't relive the life that you regret not living through them. It doesn't work. It might be the book you're reading or the bottle you're drinking or the food you're eating or the show you're watching. It might be the fact that you have just been in like, hey, I need self-care, but self-care has turned to self-centeredness, and now you're not actually living in that self-sacrificial way of service that God has called you to, and you're missing the whole mark, and all you're doing is home taking care of yourself and going on vacation. That's the world we're living in. And so when we think about how are we cheating on God, what are we cheating on God with? We've got to take a good, hard look to say, am I loving God fully and wholly? Because on the opposite side of that, we'll have continued conversations where we say, I want to grow more in the Lord. I want to grow closer to God. I want to do away with these trappings in my life. I don't want to struggle in this area anymore. I don't feel the fulfillment I first felt when I had the joy of my salvation. It's because we've allowed the trappings of this world, the sinful patterns in our life, to continue to creep back in and take back over and take us off of our focus on following God. And so we're not coming near to God. We're trying to battle not fully committing back to the world we came from, but we're being torn apart between the world and the glory of God and heaven above. And we feel that conflict in our spirit. Anybody with me today? I'm feeling the conflict in their spirit between those two things. I know I feel it. I'm going to raise my hand, not just to get you to raise your hand, but I'll raise my hand up here alone. It's a true thing. And we got to start by identifying, okay, what is it in my life? What is that problem. I want to share with you 1 John 2.15. This is in the message version. I'll share with the NIV after, but it says, don't love the world's ways. I really like the way that says, because I want to point out, when you leave this little perfect little church circle environment, not that any of us are perfect, but we try and say the right things, do the right things, right? That's what we're doing on Sunday morning. We try and do that but when we leave here, we go home, we drive in the car, where there's other people at the store, uh, from fashion to media to social media to what we see on television to what our neighbor has. They've got a new lawnmower. I need a new lawn. All that kind of stuff, right? All of those things. We are saturated by the world's ways. God has plucked us out of the world's ways and said, come follow my ways. But if we don't realize that we're following the same ways of the world, we're going to miss out on following the ways of God on this side of eternity. And this says, don't love the world's goods. What none of these passages have said, even in James, don't love people. We can love people. We're not even the people who are far from God. We can love them. We just can't love their ways or some of the goods that they're provide, providing. Uh, the product that they say you need to have. The things that you have to do to be complete in life. You are complete in life, by the way, for eternity. The moment that you declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's nothing else you can add or take away from your life that's going to make you any more or less complete. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the love of the world, sque I love how it says this, squeezes out love for the Father. Meaning that there's only space inside of us to love one or the other, not both. That's a pretty profound word from the message translation, wouldn't you know? In NIV, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. For if you love the world, you cannot fully have the love of the Father. And so selfish desires cause division and destruction. How are we doing on the problem so far? So we've had the promise, right? We've had the process, we've got the problem. 
How about we talk about the posture a little bit? How about we talk about what we do need? You guys ready? You with me so far? You've identified a couple things in your life that you're like, you know what, I've had enough. If you've had enough of this battle, we just say it with me here today. You don't even have to say it a lot. It's really loud, but say it with me loud enough to hear the person you say. Say, I've had enough. We just had enough. We're oversaturated with, with what the enemy's messaging is. We're oversaturated with the politi- political landscape of our world, of all the things that are in our place, of our own heart. We're oversaturated with those things, and we got to just say enough is enough. And James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's what we're headed towards. We need to talk about what humility looks like. As I said earlier, as soon as we start saying, oh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm humble, or I'm trying to be humble, <laughs> we've then become proud, right? I'm way, Dave, I'm way more humble than you are. That sounds like a humble statement, right? Just kidding. Dave's way, he's a very humble guy. I love him. But what does humility look like? We just put a short list together here today. It's not that short. It's 10 things. I would get your phone out because you're not going to process all of these. I'm going to give you one at a time. We're going to go through all 10 of them here today. But what does it mean to draw near to God? Because it sounds good. But if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, what does it look like? And so we took an attempt at it. Could there have been a list of 30 things? 100%. I think we have time for 10. So we'll see what this looks like. But humility is a hard, hard thing for us. First off is you serve without needing recognition. Now, that might be here in the church, it might be in a ministry, and you say, hey, you know, Scripture also says outdo one another, showing honor, so it's okay to honor those who are serving, but at the same time, if we're doing it because we need the recognition and the honor, we want to see our name on a list somewhere or on a screen somewhere, if that's the sole purpose we did it, you shouldn't do it. And I'm not telling you that, like, you should just quit doing it. What I'm telling you is is that we should pray about, God, why are my motives here? What that is, is is us trying to lift ourselves up as opposed to humbling ourselves and letting God lift us up. It's a much better look if, you know, John is serving and and I share with John or or, or give John some the, the honor or encouragement that he's due for what he does as opposed to him saying, hey, I'm here every week doing connections and Bible study and blah, 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 blah. That's not a good look, right? That's not humility. But even beyond that, let's get outside of the church world for a minute. God tells us, Jesus tells us, that it's better to serve than be served. He called us to come to be servants uh, to others. And if we want to be great, we have to become their servant, is what he told the uh, the, uh, disciples. And so when we think about that, when we're out in the world, you're in your workplace, you're in your home, you're in your neighborhood, and you see, let's say it's a piece of trash on the ground. If someone's looking, do you pick it up? If no one's looking, do you pick it up? Do you only pick it up if someone's looking? It's a little test. You think about that. You think, oh, am I going to just keep walking by that, let someone else get it, or am I going to pick that up? You know, if you, if you help out and do a little extra at work, is that something that you just do because you have a servant's heart and you don't need recognition and that's okay, or do you do it because you're hoping you'll get a raise or you'll get recognition, or do you have to walk in and tell everybody what you just did and how extra you did it? Because you kind of stripped yourself of God's blessing in that situation. But it's a big one when we think about it. And, And kids in the room, anybody that's still under your parents' roof, to serve without being asked and out needing recognition goes a long way with us parents. Parents, can I get a thank you and amen for that one? You're welcome. It's true, though. You see others as equals. That's a place of humility. And so I think in the nice church world, we'd sit in here and go, oh yeah, everybody's equal. But, but, someone say but. Man, there's a whole issue here with us in our humility. We don't always see others as equals. And maybe it's, it's, it, it could potentially be a race thing. It could be a nationality thing. It could be an economic thing. It could be what they do for a line of work. I mean, there's all kinds of ways. It could be just the guy who never picks up the trash in his yard across the street, and now you look down on him. You don't see him as equals anymore because they don't keep their houses neat and tidy. I'm not going to have you raise hands on that one, but come on. We can be really petty about how we look down on other people. Would you guys agree with that here today? But we've got to see each other as equals. 
God lifted us up to be a brother and sister of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior God Almighty. He, he brought us up to his level. He did so by stooping basically to our level to bring us to his. Shouldn't we have that same kind of heart? You admit when you're wrong. This one's going to sting a little bit. We struggle sometimes to just admit that we're wrong. We definitely would, ra- I'd much rather John be wrong than me, right? It was John's fault. I'm going to blame him. It's his fault. But I want to blame someone else for doing something wrong. I don't want to blame myself. I don't want to take ownership of it. By the way, go to Genesis 3. I think Adam did that right away, didn't he? He goes, oh, the woman made me do it. I mean, deferring, deference happened right away, right from the beginning, okay? This is an age-old problem that we don't admit when we're wrong. Anybody with me? But it feels really good to sincerely and honestly just take ownership for what you did and for your actions and make that apology, which we'll get to in a second, uh, but to own that and bring it before the Lord and say, God, I, I did this wrong. Help me to do it right. That's that moment of humility where we leave that pride behind. You allow others to speak into your life. I like to say it this way. You can always tell someone from the New England area, but you never can really tell them much. I saw a t-shirt one time. I adopted that from you. You can always tell an Irishman, but you can never tell them much. Being an Irishman, I'm safe to say that. But the truth is, is that you can always tell who a human being is, but you can never tell them much. We don't take, we don't take input from others very well. We've worked really hard here at Christ Community Church to have what we call a feedback culture. And those feedback cultures, they hurt a little bit. I get feedback from anybody who wants to give it. A lot of times it's unsolicited, but I, I read it and absorb it. Uh, but the elders and other staff members, we've got to have feedback. The other part is, is that if you want to walk in humility and resist the enemy, you need to open yourselves up to someone who's trusted, a brother or sister in the Lord, whatever gender is appropriate there, and have accountability because you can't see the back of your own head, guys. We need to allow someone to say, hey, Fred, you know, I love you, dude, but that one, that, that thing, that wasn't a good look. Like, I don't know if I love you enough to take the risk of our friendship to tell you what happened. That's what humility and love looks like. On his side is to receive it with humility. My way is to say it with humility. Does that make sense to everybody here today? You're aware of your limitations. Now, Some of you are like, oh yeah, I got all kinds of limitations. Let me just tell you a little personal confession here. I think I can do anything all the time. If I can watch it on YouTube or read it in a book, I think I can do it. I can do a lot of things. I can't do many things well, though, and I definitely can't do all things all the time, which I would love to do, right, Chris? I just want to do it all, all the time. Um, But at the same time, if we think we don't have any limitations, well, how much are we actually looking at God as being totally reliant on him when we think we can do it all ourselves? We need to acknowledge our limitations. Really, those limitations, when we get led to prayer, is an often a telltale sign to say, hey, God, this is beyond my ability. All of life really should be prayed over. I 100% agree with that. But as we think about, hey, here's my limitations. I want to grow in my dependence on him for whatever it is. A lot of times in that battle between the little Diablo in our life, the little devil in our life, that battle, we're depending on that thing for comfort or for escape or for care or some sort of sense of control or some sense of being able to be in charge of that thing or we think we have it under control, all of those things are this moment here where we're not realizing what our limitations are, but when we turn and bring it to God and say, God, I don't know how to care for this need. I've got to stop caring for it with that sinful behavior. I want to totally rely on you. That's what it means to look beyond our limitations and say, God, I I can't do this on my own. I I need you, Holy Spirit, to be with me. I need others to speak into my life in this area. I cannot do this alone. And guess what that takes? A stripping away of our pride and a lot of humility. Number six, you repent daily. By the way, uh, running, resisting, and repeating is a daily walk of repentance. Most of us in the room are on the daily walk of confession. We feel bad for what we did, so we confess it to God and ask for forgiveness, but then we just get up and do it again tomorrow. 
And we go, oh, God will forgive me. It's true. It's said in the passage today that he gives us more grace. Can we say thank God for your grace? Thank God for your grace. Like, he gives us more grace, more grace than we could ever imagine or, or account for or out sin. But at the same time, he wants us not to walk a walk of confession, but a walk of repentance. The word repent in scripture just means to turn. So think about it. We run to God and we turn away from evil. And so now this is that daily walk of repentance. But every single day, yes, we confess, but also we're slowly turning our heart towards God over and over and over again. Romans 12 says that actually rewires our brain so we don't even want to do those things anymore. Praise God for that. I can tell you that that is true in my life and many people's lives in the room that as we do that over and over and over again, okay, we run, we resist, and we do what over here? Repeat. Little step by little step by little step by little step. Don't think big things. Think this next minute. Can you run to God, resist the enemy for the next 60 seconds? Great, let's do it again the 60 seconds after that and the 60 seconds after that. Let's live life kind of one minute at a time. That sounds a lot easier, right? Then when you look at the whole picture of yourself and like, oh my gosh, I got more problems than I got paper and pen. But no, I got today, I got this one minute I'm in and I can return, I can, I can run to the Lord, I can resist the enemy and I can just keep repeating that over and over and over and over again. We're fully dependent on God for his grace and blessings. We've talked about that some here today. Here's the other part about humility. Someone who's walking in humility, they listen well. They listen well. I like to talk. I probably use 40,000 words a day or something. I don't know, but I do like to talk. But I've grown in listening because the deepest connection I can make with someone is not sharing with them everything that's on my heart, but finding out what's on theirs. I can pray for them better. I can care for them better. A lot of times, too, the best thing I can do for another brother or sister in the Lord is just to listen. More times than not, I've talked with someone and sat and just asked questions as opposed to making statements, and I'd listened, and then their feedback was that was the first time they felt like anyone had heard them. And we can all do better at that. But we've got to set our own agendas aside. We've got to, all the fixers in the room. I don't need you to raise your hand, but we're fixers around here. We've got to put all that aside and listen well. Here's the other one. We've, number nine, we forgive without expectations. God is a God of forgiveness. Jesus came to forgive us. He's filled us with forgiveness. He wants us to walk in forgiveness without any expectations. This means a lot of things here. This means that those who have harmed us in life, we need to then forgive them, but without expecting anything to reciprocate in the, in the, in the return. Meaning that there's many people that we need to forgive, and our first thought is, is, well, they're not ready to receive forgiveness. Anyone ever make that statement? This is a real show of hands. You gotta forgive someone, you're like, oh, well, they're not ready to receive forgiveness. It's okay, it's a human nature. I feel the same way about some things. And so God's had to work on me over over my time, I, I've shared that even about my dad that I just forgave him even though I don't think he really was ready to receive forgiveness. But that's not what the word of God says. It says I have to forgive him. I have to give up my right to be right. I've got to give up my need for justice or uh, any type of restitution in those areas. Sometimes that comes, sometimes it doesn't. And so I need to forgive without expectations from the other person. God just calls us to forgive the action of the person we've forgiven is on the person, not on us. And then lastly, number 10 is, you are grateful to God for all you have. So we walk in gratitude. And so this is just the starter. But what God wants us to do is to walk in humility before him, is to draw near to him, to resist the enemy so he'll flee from us. And then he tells us, he goes on in that passage, to no longer be those adulterous people, to no longer be kind of cheating on God with things. And if we know that we're cheating on God with things, we've got to repent of those things. We've got to call them what they are, as hard as it may be. And look, those are some hard things sometimes. It could be addiction. You could be maybe living with your boyfriend or girlfriend in sin, and you're like, I can't afford to move out. I can't afford to do different. That might be the situation you're in. But if you said yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've got to look at the Word of God and say, okay, am I going to align my life with that, or am I going to ignore that before God? Am I going to continue to cheat at work and try and get ahead in a way that's unethical? It's going to cost me a lot of money if I change how I 
conduct myself at work. You gotta ask yourself, are you fully, totally surrendered to God? Are you willing to make those sacrifices so that when we humble ourselves, he will exalt us? And it's three easy steps. We've gotta run, we've gotta resist, and we've gotta repeat. Let's try it again. Run. Uh, wait. That's it. I want us to leave today thinking, okay, how do I walk this journey of repentance and sanctification and grow closer to God? I run to God. I resist the devils in my life continually, and the promise, remember, they'll flee from us, and then we do it over and over and over and over again. I can tell you and guarantee you based on the word of God that he tells us this, that if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up. Let's stand together here. We're going to read 7 and 8 one more time, and then we're going to close with a worship song here today. Submit to yourselves, then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word here today. God, we could have expanded on more things that we need to repent of or turn from. But God, the truth is, in either a little way or even a very large way here in this room and online, we cheat on you, God. Our heart is wayward. Forgive us, God, of our sins. Lord, we want to just continually run to you and resist the sin and the temptation and the, the little devils and the devil in our life. Give us power. Help us to put on the full armor of God, as Ephesians 6 would say. Help us, God, to walk closer and closer to you, God. But Lord, may we not make it complicated. May we just think about it one minute, one hour, one day at a time, Lord, as we pursue you fully and wholly and trust in you, for what you promise to us is, is that you, when we humble ourselves before you, you will lift us up. You will lift us up and fill us with your abundant life and your glory and your blessings. And I pray that over every single person here as we, as we labor along, as we struggle along, as sometimes we have doubts in our beliefs, as we struggle through different temptations in life, as we go through hardships and financial situations and relationships and physical ailments, God, may we just rely on you more and more and more. Holy Spirit, would you fill each person in a special way that ministers to their heart to encourage their soul of the promises that you've given us, God, that you have come to pull us out of our gloom all the way up into your glory, God, we pray. God, we thank you for this word here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that the service today connected with you and helped you grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you have any prayer needs or simply would like somebody to reach out or come alongside you in your faith journey, please let us know by filling out our online connect card or simply emailing us at christcommunity at cccfamily.com. If this online service has blessed you in any way and you feel led to support the ministry at Christ Community Church financially, please visit our website and consider donating so we can continue to make as many resources available as possible to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless.